on today's episode. Please help me in welcoming the New York Times bestselling author of the seminal works, Never Eat Alone and Who's Got Your Back? Keith Ferrazzi. You almost always need relationships to shift away from something that's so core and innate. The question is how? How are you gonna go from here to here? Because if you're gonna help this audience break through the matrix, the question is, how do you open up porosity? The hows that we talk about here in the organization are definitions. You need to define what you want. So getting people to be highly specific about what they want and then incredibly intentional about how they're gonna go about getting it. It's time to go inside Quest with host Tom Bilyeu, president and co-founder of the second fastest growing private company in America. And now, he's uncovering the universal principles of success. I can tell you right now what principle number one is, follow your passion. Inside Quest starts right now. Welcome to Inside Quest, everyone. We're in foster care for the mind. Our goal is to bring on amazing people who will adopt our brains and help guide us into becoming something more powerful. And if you're looking for an intellectual adoption, there's no one better than today's guest. He grew up humbly in a small town in Pennsylvania where his father was a steel worker and his mother was a cleaning lady but he clawed his way from his blue collar beginnings to become the youngest CMO of a Fortune 500 company and has since founded and run several other highly successful companies as well. He is living proof that the American dream of self-transformation is alive and well if you're willing to constantly work, learn, and grow. The counterintuitive secret that's made him famous? Generosity. Both Forbes and Inc. Magazine have called him one of the world's most connected people. Please help me in welcoming the New York Times best-selling author of the seminal works Never Eat Alone and Who's Got Your Back, the CEO and founder of Ferrazzi Greenlight and the man who birthed an astonishing level of success by showing people that, and I quote, business is human. None other than Keith Ferrazzi. Keith, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this all right, so I had this all mapped out in my head, how it yep. was gonna go, I was doing all my preparation, then I come down, we're taking photos together to promote the show, and you start peppering me with questions that I had the most clumsy and elegant answers for. You were sweating, actually. I was, I was sweating. literally sweating. And I thought, this is gonna be an awesome episode. So the Good. goal of the show, really, it was sort of my selfish desire to bring people on that I thought were amazing and could really help me advance. You've had some great friends advance. of mine on the, on the show, people I really respect. And I've known about you for years because I'd read your books just, and that was actually how we started happens when tracking you're old. you down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Questions you were asking me all centered around a quote that I had pulled from something that you wrote. And so I just want to kick things off with that. And it goes like this. Human behavior change doesn't happen through knowledge. If it happened through knowledge, then nobody on a diet would eat a piece of cake. The bottom line is we need to experience behavior change. Small doses of incremental positive experiences change mindsets. You change the behavior to change the mindset. I, actually, I think, I think that was a very kind and generous phraseology of what I said. What I said is, if knowledge was enough to change human behavior, we'd have no smokers or fat people. <laughs> so, I mean, at the end of the day, you've got to do shit. You gotta get stuff done. You have to put things into practice to actually be able to shift behavior. It's not conceptual. It's gotta be action oriented. Right. How did you come to that? <laughs> a, a lot of bullshit. I mean, there's too much talk so about wh stuff. What do you mean by a lot of bullshit? No, what I mean, what I, that's what I mean. I, it's like, I, I've spent years around forming and shaping intellectual property. Um, I was the uh, uh, chief marketing officer of Deloitte Consulting. And a part of that was the, the birthing and the creation of intellectual property methodologies and things that transformed major corporations, right? right? And all too often, we, we go into situations with mindsets and thoughts and concepts that we haven't taken it down to the how-to level. So, you know, I could say to you, build a relationship. You gotta build a relationship to be effective at your business. Right. What the hell does that mean? I mean, what does it mean today? What are you gonna get up today? What are you gonna do differently this morning that will actually manifest a deeper relationship, right? How do you walk into a room differently? What do you look for? What do you say? How do you retain and stay in touch with that relationship? Those are called practices, right? And I believe that what we should be seeking when we're trying to change human behavior are high return practices. Talk about weight loss, right? When I, um, in the past, have tried to get really ripped and jacked, what I do is I, I stop putting cream in my coffee. Right. right. That's the high return practice that makes me trigger in the morning that says, OK, I am on a diet and not putting cream on my coffee is a small sacrifice. What does that mean then that I should not eat or do at breakfast? 
right? Small little actions and practices. Does that make sense to you? It, it, so, it so really what I was, does. What I was peppering you about this morning was breaking out of the matrix. Right. You know, I was like, what a great concept. Under, I, and I understand shifting mindsets. So what I would love to do is I'd love to dive in and understand what are the high return practices for somebody watching this show? Right. Right. To shift out of the matrix, to build deeper relationships, to to bring human behavior change into our lives. I mean, that's the stuff that I think people will walk away from and actually get stuff, something from. All right. Then let's get uh, a little bit crazy. The design of the show was always to actually free these people and myself, quite frankly, from the matrix. And up until now, so a lot of this, as I'm sure you would um, agree, so much of where you are today is just a reflection of the experiences that you've had and how you reacted to them. So mm -hmm. the thing that I always struggled with in my own escape from the matrix, right? Because I grew up, um, I grew up middle class, but once I graduated from college, my parents completely cut me off from financial support. I'm actually grateful for that. But then that put me into a period of, of real poverty uh, and, and trying to find my way out. And my first step out was to view myself as the king of remedial jobs. And I was like really proud of that. And it's something I've talked about on the show before and it's absolutely ridiculous and was holding me back. And it wasn't until I met people who could actually help me put the practices in place to get out of the matrix. But then I didn't focus on, it was actually the practices that got me out. Can I stop for a second? Let me, let me go back for a second. Um, you, you were the king of remedial jobs. Yep. Um, there was an assumption in your mind at the time that that's what you were worth. That's what you needed to do. And your incapacity, which is what you're saying is your incapacity to break out of those remedial jobs was a challenge? Is that what you were suggesting? You want a real answer? Uh, no, just screw it. I can me. bullshit you yeah, for bullshit speed me. or yeah, right, yeah, um, yeah. The, the truth is that uh, we all build our self-esteem around something. It's something I'm going to ask you about yeah. later, but we all want to feel good. And it was very ego protective of me to only apply for jobs that I knew I would go in and kill, that I would mm -hmm. get whatever job I went into. Right. But I was going into like the baseline right. job right. where I could tell that people were like, why are you applying for this job? You're overeducated. Right. But I was applying for yeah, one simple reason. Fail. I knew, yeah, I knew I wouldn't fail. Yeah. I'm going to get this job and yeah. that's going to feel really awesome. Yeah. And that's led to me really thinking about the tyranny of being chosen and how people so, lose years of their so lives. So we have a construct when we're, our, our primary business at Frazi Greenlight is to change human behavior in the workplace. Yep. That's what we do. We, we've got the blessing of some of the world's most prestigious companies helping them shift human behavior. And our, and our objective is to grow companies, um, but also to grow people at the same time. And one of the things we always get people to look at is what are their glass ceilings? A glass ceiling is in a sense an addictive behavior that you have that holds you back from success, but you keep doing it anyway. It's a practice though. So it's like, an addiction is nothing more than something you do that holds you back and you keep doing it anyway, right? That could be overeating, that could be smoking, it could be drugs, it could be sex, it could be procrastination, it could be taking jobs that are you know, under your capability. Those are addictions and we've got to identify them as such, right? And we identify them at the practice level so that we can begin to practice getting out of those specific addictions. Sure. And then what we do is we apply a methodology that we've learned over the years, which is you don't get out of addictions by yourself. You almost always need relationships to shift away from something that's so core and innate that's difficult that you've consistently become familiar with. Right. You need people to shift you out of your old familiars. Right. So one of the curious, and I know you were going to ask me about mentorships, etc. My assumption is that somewhere along the way in your capacity to, to lift your glass ceiling, you had relationships that were critical to that. I did. What I found problematic was my growing obsession with the why. Why did I break out of the matrix? Why did I yeah. encounter these mentors that we'll talk about in a second that presented to me a worldview that was different than the one that I had and I adopted it. Yeah. And that became the thing that I held on to. And in real time, I'm not kidding, in real time, like 10 minutes ago, you totally shifted my view of what I should be focused on. Yeah, I don't like the why. I don't like the way, I want, I want to know the how. How, right? You talk about I that. I want to know the how. Many companies talk about the, um, the why all the time. You know, big, major, very prestigious and well-respected consultancies like McKinsey and others are constantly trying to understand what a company should do differently. W you know, why did we get here? And what's the positioning, et cetera? I don't give a damn. I mean, I kind of do. I, I, yes, you need a strategy. Yes, you need a process. And, but almost every company intellectually understands those things. Right. The question is how? How are you gonna go from here to here? Because at the end of the day, there's a bunch of people that need to, what we call, open up porosity. Yeah. So at some point in your life, porosity, porousness 
is the, um, is the absorptive factor. A sponge is very porous, right? A, a pan or a Teflon is, is not, it just slides off you. Most of us walk around this world like Teflon. Everything slides off us, very little gets in, really soaks in. So if you're trying to change a human, you were, you were taking mindless jobs because you could be successful at them. What opened up porosity? How did you open up porosity? Because if you're gonna help this audience break through the matrix, if I'm gonna help this audience embrace people in a more effective way in their lives and develop deeper relationships and achieve human behavior change, the question is, how do you open up porosity? And I know one of the great levers of opening up porosity is opening yourself up to people who can guide you in that process. Because it's very infrequent that given our own tools, given the own set of circumstances, et cetera, that you've been done, you know, if you keep doing what you've done, you're gonna get what you got. So it's the process change right. that has to happen. So where, where's, your, where's your how? The hows that we talk about here in the organization are definitions. You need to define what you want. So I have interviewed over 1,200 people and you start seeing patterns emerge in that process. One of the patterns is what people want. And they're gonna tell you that they want to be happy, but then they don't ever define what actually makes them happy. And then if they do define that, the job that they're applying for has absolutely nothing to do with that. So getting people to be highly specific about what they want and then incredibly intentional about how they're gonna go about getting it. How many people actually say they want to be happy? Really? Like if you interview? say, if you say to somebody, you know, like, what do you really want? Mm -hmm. How many people, their first reaction is, I want to be happy? Almost 100%. Really? I've interviewed literally yeah. in the inner cities, yeah. all the way to here interviewing people for C So the first positions. reaction in the inner cities, because I've got two foster kids, one who's 17, African-American, inner city kid, yep. and another one who's 21. He's basically a cocktail shaker of every race you could possibly imagine. I'm trying to get those kids to break through the recognition and the understanding that what they really want is happiness. Frankly, I'm trying to get to my understanding of that. Sure. I mean, I grew up thinking that if I was happy, I wouldn't be successful, therefore I didn't want to be happy. Right. I mean, scarcity and fear and, and you know, it's like happiness, that's a luxury. By the way, I don't believe that today, but, I, but, I, but if I were echoing what I hear in a lot of people's more vulnerable inner feelings, happiness is a fucking luxury. But one of the things that I'm trying to do is I actually believe that deep down inside, most people don't believe happiness was, is within reach, nor do they believe that they're worthy of it. And most people have dismissed the fact that that's a real goal. Some people, particularly in the corporate worlds I deal with, your old matrix, right. people would suggest that it might be antithetical to productivity and high performance even, mm. which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, I try to get people to crack open their hearts enough to be porous, open to the principle that you actually can achieve happiness and success in parallel through a different set of relationships with coworkers. Through a Why do you think that is? Why is that so effective? Well, um, I have so much to thank the Gallup organization that um, when I was first for starting research. for their research. Okay. Yeah. When I was first starting our research institute, um, I was standing on the shoulders of giants like Gallup, who proved that, um, that employee engagement was a predictor of productivity. They could do right. direct correlations. And, and they proved uh, in the Q12 that one of the critical linchpins to employee engagement is friendships, mm. in bonding, connectivity, and support. Um, and, and I, we, I think we all know it intuitively that if you, you know, and, and I translate it to say, if your boss truly cares about you and your success, right? Yeah. Have you ever had a boss that truly cared about you and your success? You bound out of bed with a different spring in your step. You're willing to work harder on weekends without resentment. You connect more deeply with the peers around you. You probably have more courage in the workplace. You take risks. You are more candid. You receive feedback, right? All of these are elements of business success. And, and what's joyful about this whole thing, and what's just the, the journey that I'm on, on a personal basis in my own companies, um, and what we're bringing to large corporations all over the world, including in cultures where you would have never imagined them embracing it, is that you can actually have joy an extraordinary shareholder value. And you can be on a journey of transforming a company and at the same time become a better spouse or a better you know, mother or father.
right. and that those are not antithetical, but instead they're absolutely hardwired as the same. Um, so what are the hows to happiness? It's, it's interesting. I, you know, I, I'm stymied with the question and I'll be happy to answer it because again, I, I even just on a very vulnerable and, and personal basis, I still have tapes that play in the back of my head around happiness that make that elusive. Um, I, I just had my 49th birthday uh, last week. Um, and I asked uh, all of my friends to give me the gift of a, of a card that in it on one side of the card would say um, what they most admire in me that they want me to keep doing more of this year. Right. And on the other side, because they love me, um, what is it that they would suggest I change in my behavior um, in the coming year? I want to hit 50 with a just, you know, a momentum that is right. continuing to burst through a personal You call growth. that compassionate criticism, right? Exactly. And guys, I, I embrace all the time. I think that there's such richness around us. We should all be 360 degree sponges of what people feel and think. It doesn't mean you act on all of it. Sure. Right? It doesn't mean you let it bring you down. You use the data to analyze and decide what you're going to do. Um, so when you ask the question, what's the core to happiness? Um, the first thing that I would say, depending upon where you are in your, your journey toward it and your recognition of it is, ask the people around you what they think you could do differently to achieve more of it. To and achieve more happiness. To achieve more happiness. Okay. And I, in a sense, I really asked that question in my, in my, my, my birthday. And what people said was, um, number one thing was to let go. I mean, I, I grew up a poor kid in Pittsburgh. You know, dad, as you mentioned, I mean, very poor kid, very, no means. And um, I did have to work my ass off for everything that I achieved. And to this very day, I, I still have this tape that plays in the back of my head that if small things go wrong, I won't pay the rent. Right. So letting go and, you know, everybody respects my drive and ambition. But at the same time, they're like, enough. Right. You are enough. You have enough. So tip number one is there, there is a rich resource around you that every one of you has. If you just open yourself up and had the courage to listen, you don't have to believe it all. You control the data. That, that's probably one of the breakthrough ideas. All right, let's talk then about the porousness of, or the how of getting porous to that kind of criticism, which will feed, I think, into where I wanna go on self-esteem and stuff. But so you carry, if I'm not mistaken, you carry with you at all times a list of character defects. Yep. Is that true? Yep. Okay, this is freaky. And I, he's, you guys have gotta look Keith up on the internet. There are amazing interviews that have been done with him before. And I saw this in one of the interviews and it, rocked me and I was like okay so the reason this is so powerful and, to me, and, and the reason they're on paper is they change right the stuff that I'm working on at any given time changes from one time or another but yes but think about think about what that means he carries around a list of the things about himself that he thinks are defective that he needs to change and, without and, and eroding the things that I need to lean into and do stronger it's both sides of that card okay okay both sides of the card which goes back to what now, you were my saying. natural inclination is to kick my own ass for not being enough and wanting to just focus on the defects. That is right. my natural inclination. What I've been told on my 49th birthday is enough, <laughs> let it go. Right. You know, you actually are enough and focus as much on the positives as, as on the negatives. But it, like, I mean, I, I'm a constant moving machine. Um, always trying to be better, always trying to be better. Okay, so help us understand the how of when you go, I'm going to now carry this list. I'm going to face it. I'm going to own up to the yep. things that I'm not strong at, but it's not going to erode me. It's not going to erode my confidence. Yeah. It's actually going to help build me up and make me stronger. How'd you become open to that? I, mean, I think like everything else, it's everything that you want to achieve has to be achieved in small doses of practice. Okay. Once again, getting back to the concept of high return practices. Um, what was the high return practice on this one? So on this one, the high return practice is a small dose that you actually achieve. So I'll, I'll use an example of my boy, right? So 12-year-old um, inner city, half African-American, half Mexican kid comes into our house, 32 homes before he came into our home. Whoa. Right? So what's he, what's he expecting? This is number 33, right? So he's not going to trust. He's not going to open up. In fact, he'll probably blow it up so that he can control this before someone kicks him out. Right. School, forget about it. You know, behavior, forget about it. None of these things were 
in, in, of interest to him. So I'm sitting there and all I'm trying to do is trying to get, get him to gain a small piece of self-esteem, right? And so I heard him and he is a smart kid. God, he's smart. He's, he's witty, he's smart, he's interesting, he's intellectual, and he's a great freestyle rapper. So he's sitting in the back of the car and he's, he's like calling out his friends doing freestyle rapping contests. And he's kicking their ass. And I think this is great. And so I said to him one time, I said, you're really good at this. Why don't you write it down? And, you know, why don't you like refine that a little bit? Right. And he's like, yeah, well, writing stuff down's for, and he had some epitaph, right? right. Um, <laughs> and I said, okay, fine. So the next time he's rapping with his buddies, I taped it. And afterward, I said, hey, listen to this. And I played it. And he was like, oh, that sucks. And I said, yeah, I don't know that. I think it's pretty good. He's like, well, let me do that again. And all of a sudden, now he's into it, right? Now I had a hook. You know what? You don't get rap lessons if your grades are that way. So now he cares about something. Right. Okay? So the key for all of us in self-esteem is finding one small strength that you can, you can win at. Now, in the case of this, which is reversal of character defects, pick something small. It's the cream in the coffee, right? Pick something small that you're going to work at. Celebrate it. Ask people around you to help you. Say, hey, listen, here's something small I'm working on, and, and, I, and, and I want you to like, make sure I'm successful. Create a posse around you. Check in every day. Live in daily consultation around your character defect with a group of people and celebrate the hell out of winning, right? You're, you're not trying to kick yourself for the loss. You're looking for opportunities to celebrate the win. Celebration is the, is the attraction. And, and all of a sudden, the character defect turns into a, a, a friggin' victory, right? Now, we bring exactly this to large corporations. This is what transforms shareholder value one group, one division, one practice at a time. Right. When you take somebody who has experienced significant setbacks in their life, like my right. boy, I mean, my setbacks ain't nothing compared to his, right? But for all of us, we have setbacks we have in our lives. Why do some people use it as, as, as supercharged fuel? Mm -hmm. And why do others collapse? You I mean, are asking the right question. And now I know how to get somebody to change. I really do. I know how to get people to change. We do that every day. I put my money on the table. I go into large corporations. I take a reduced fees in, in service of upside potential for actually making a company's people change in ways that they have never changed for decades. Right. Bankrupt Fortune 20 companies, oh. right? Turning around. We can do that. I get it. I have full confidence that we can transform human behavior. No question at all. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to push on this nerve a little bit. So you're in Guatemala. Yeah. Uh, the Greenlight Giving Foundation, which is your philanthropic organization, has what sounds like to be this amazing outreach program there. Uh, and something in how you guys talk about it really caught my eye, which mm. is that you take high. Way, thank potential. you so much for being so caring to be so well prepared for sure for for this kind of a dialogue you're hitting on stuff that really matters to me so thank cool. you cool absolutely uh, honestly it's so meaningful to me that you would show up and you really impacted me back there i'm not making that up and it will echo through this entire company um, but what you're doing in Guatemala is fascinating and it, it hit on something. So because we're in manufacturing, first of all, I used to big brother for an inner city, um, African American kid who was in foster care, which I felt an immediate connection to you with that. I was his guardian through the court as it came out that his adopted mother was beating him. Uh, and I was the one that helped him actually get in foster care. And then I saw foster care, pull him away from me. So yeah. I've lived in a much smaller way than you, but I've lived that nightmare of seeing this really bright kid with all this potential sort of yeah. just fritter away. Um, but you guys said we look for high potential yeah. orphans in Guatemala and we teach them. And I thought the, the magic in that statement is understanding how you recognize who has high potential. Yeah, I go down to Guatemala and within, you know, five minutes of some of the coolest, uh, you know, hotels and, and places around you see ridiculous abject poverty of kids eating if lucky once a day right. kind of thing, right? Um, it's very powerful. And I wanted my boy to see this. You know, they may be eating once a day. You know, their mother may be being abused by their fathers. Um, you know, they may have uh, they lost their parents and yet they find happiness. It's, it's really, it's moving. Um, but anyways, you go down there. I don't pick 
high potential youth. The community does. Interesting. I show up and that's the point. It's about the community. I show up and I say to the community, listen, I know that um, you all want the best for all of your kids, but there's a number of kids among your kids who we could give a shot to, like a very different shot. Right. Right. And so you guys decide. And it's so quick for them. They know the kid with the spark, right? They know the, the one with the drive. And sometimes we'll find them ourselves, like we'll be walking around and all of a sudden this little boy comes up and he like wants to be our tour guide. Like, and he's got charisma and energy and all of a sudden we're touring. He's like, he's an amazing little kid. And you just, and you're like, damn, this one deserves a shot. But the other thing that we do is we, we organize, we do the same thing we do in large companies. We organize all these kids into small peer to peer support groups. So you got these little kids from, you know, like from four all the way up through, through teenage years organized into small groups and the teens are taking under the wings of the little ones and they all commit to not letting each other fail and from breaking out of wow. poverty together. Yeah. And we teach them our principles of relationships. We teach them how to network. We teach these little kids, you talk about seeing what potential is. These kids don't know anything other than go picking beans. So we say to these kids, what might you want to do? And they have no clue. They don't even know, they don't have an idea of what they might want to do. Right. So we tell them by the time they get together next week, they have to go interview people. They don't even know what that means. So go interview somebody and, and it's like, well, who do you think has a better life than you do? Right. Well, that shopkeeper or that tourist person. Okay, well, go ask them what they do. So they go out, these little kids go out and they come back and then they talk about it. all of a sudden we're given the potential through self-analysis and, and self-exploration, right? It's such an interesting point that you touch on. One of the things that working with underprivileged kids has taught me is perspective influences every aspect of your life. Yeah. So I was big brothering for this kid and he, I, I was trying to help him develop a career path. Like, what do you want to do with your life? And I was a kid at the time, so forgive me, this is all terrible. Uh, but you know, trying to get him to identify what he wants to do. So I said, what do you like to do? Yeah. I really like art. Fantastic. Okay, what could we do in art? Well, I also really like heights. Oh, cool. Okay, so I'm thinking okay, maybe he could be like a pilot. What's the thing you want to do? And he's like, maybe I could be one of the guys that hangs the billboards. I was like, wow. So it was such a disconnect for me. Like, because yeah. this was like the dream big. Yeah. Tell me, what's your fantasy job? Yeah. Athlete, run a company, be a pilot, a surgeon. Yeah. Like, and it was to be the guy to hang the signs. And I'm not, there's nothing wrong with being the guy to hang the signs. Yeah. But he couldn't see beyond, like he couldn't see to owning that business. He couldn't see so, to- So, you know, one day at a time, one step at a time. There's nothing wrong with that. What I would do in a situation like that is I'd say, that's interesting. Let's go figure it out. Let's go talk to a sign hanger. Like, let's go ask him, what's the job like? How much money do you get? Do you feel happy at the job? You know, like you need to let the kids come to their own exploration. And it's like, you don't go from here to here, small practices, one step at a time, just like, you know, cream in your coffee. Sure. Right. So the key is small incremental practices. You know, part of my power and neuroses is the extreme amount of pressure um, to achieve great things that my father gave me and right. put upon me. Right. Which has been a supercharged rocket for me. Yep. But it's also an albatross around my neck today. It's what got me here won't get me there because at some point you don't think you're ever enough. Um, and I get that emotionally and I don't want to achieve in that, Keith. I swear to you, yeah. I don't want to achieve in that. It is difficult, however, to look at what you've achieved and say that it's not amazing. So to me, I... If you want to get in my head, I can prove it to you. I would love to get in your head. Would, if we could Freaky Friday, I would Freaky Friday with you in a second. Uh, largely because I am fascinated by the... Somehow I don't know what that means, but it's a little frightening. How do you not know Freaky Friday? No. Where do you switch places? Oh, okay, got it. Technically, got it, got it. we'd have to be mother-daughter, but... See, we're in a different... <laughs> I was overlooking that. Se I was going to say, we're in a different generation. That, you know, there was yeah. like two generations of that before the show There was There was about. one for you. Jodie yeah. Foster was the, the daughter when she was young. Uh, anyway, I love that because it... One gift that I want to give to people is... The people who were with me when we founded this company and they watched me work the line and I was there, you know, with rolling pins, wore a hairnet every day and a lab coat. And that was my life for almost two years was production. So the people that were there with me, like they have a real tangible connection to the ascension 
of success that any human being can go through. And it's played out, one of the guys, Carlitos, not, I don't think he's here today in the audience, but uh, he's in our tech team now. This is a kid whose sister was shot to death on his front lawn with an AK-47 when he was 12 years old. He has known nothing but poverty and violence his entire life. He had never owned a laptop, but because of what he saw me do, to him it was real. I went from, you know, just being the guy, hands dirty, living yeah. not in any sort of fancy way, driving a terrible shitty car with a leaky exhaust. I mean, just like all the, the trappings of not being where you want to be. And because he saw that, he has risen more quickly through this company than other people who didn't see that because they're not able to hear that I have the same insecurities, I have the same voices in my head, all the things that they think are holding them back that are fucking them up, I've just learned to manage them. Right, and you yeah. talk about that. You talk about but, making but, them. Manageable. But openness of leadership is so important. Um, leaders have to show their vulnerability, and it's not something that's talked to much about, about much in the workplace. Sure. Um, because the reason someone's going to change for you is if they are empathetic to you, and you have to be empathetic to them. So if I want you to change, um, you first of all have to know that I give a damn about you. And you have to have some sense that I'm not asking you to change from a pedestal, right? But I'm, but I'm asking somebody to change from a, like, I've been there. Right. Um, if you can't do that, you don't earn permission to influence. Leadership is about earning permission to influence. And the role doesn't give you permission to influence. Most people think that the role does. I mean, it, it's so, f you, you don't... <laughs> I, I conversations with names that you would know who are CEOs of large corporations. We laugh together on how the world thinks that all they have to do is say what they want and people will comply. Right. Nobody complies. Nobody complies. People will do what they want to do. They might do enough not to get fired or not to be, you know, openly disrespectful, but deep down inside, they'll do what they want to do. Sure. And leadership has to work their ass off, vulnerably, intimately, eth uh, empathetically, generously. You, you use the word generosity. Sure. Generously to earn the right to ask someone to change. And that's a full-time job. If, if any of you um, lead people, if you're not spending 30% of your time, 30% of your time making each of your employees 30% better, right? You're not doing your job as leader, as opposed to most of your time being in meetings and dictating shit. That's a big shift. Like if I, I'm not just going to tell my employer to do something today, I got to make them 30% better. Crap. That's a big investment, a big investment. Now I come in and say, okay, now how do I do that? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to earn permission to, if I gain vulnerability, empathy, sympathy, care, now I'm working with gravity, right? And so you got to open up gravity for yourself as leadership. And then it becomes joyful. Right. Then, it be then you start experiencing happiness because it's two people in a relationship caring about each other, moving an objective forward, celebrating victory. Celebration becomes the, the currency for momentum. And this is happiness. This is happiness. Then you're getting in the groove and you're in the flywheel of, of mutual support and giving a damn and people around you that care. I mean, shit, that's, that's happiness. It's interesting. You talk about um, what predicts what people will actually respond to that change, to working with gravity, as you say. Uh, it's a great quote, and I'm going to take a second to read it if you don't mind. The greatest predictor of whether or not you're going to change is whether or not you're changing to belong to something. Uh, that resonated with me instantly as true, but I've never heard it put like that. So um, originally when we started our company, we thought we were in the psychology business, right? I got to shrink people's heads to behave differently so that they can be more productive. And then I was taught by the psychologists that uh, most of our psychologies relative to relationships and other thing are locked and loaded at a very young age before six, right? So I was like, well, what the hell are you good for then, <laughs> right? So I started looking around for other forms of science and, and I really had our breakthroughs when we stumbled upon the, the role of anthropology in our lives. Everybody here, and I love the diversity in this room, it's beautiful, 
everybody here is, is um, all of the same tribe. Ultimately, when we were born in the human species 70,000 years ago, we were one of 14 distinct tribes. And if you weren't in a tribe, what would happen? Toast. You, yeah, you'd be eaten by something, right? So you are, are highest functioning in a tribe. And when you're outside of a tribe, you're scarcity minded, you're fearful, you're skittish, your reptilian brain's firing in overdrive, right? By the way, unfortunately today, we don't have enough tribes. Families don't eat together. Church groups don't have the same power as they used to. So um, if you here, which I know you're trying to and you're not using the words, but if you here can create a tribe, that's the highest performing entity. Tribes have four core characteristics. Um, deep intimacy where you actually give a damn about each other. Strong generosity where you're working in service of each other, not just in service of your boss, right. not a hub and spoke. I love that. And high degrees of candor, because of course we're telling each other the truth, because anything short of that is stealing. It's like, if I'm not telling you the truth, I'm, I'm holding you back. It's stealing. I, I try to use words like that. Um, and finally is accountability that is peer-to-peer -peer oriented, um, not just hierarchical. And all of that combined is, is, is creates a tribe that won't let each other fail. Now ask yourself if it quest yet, you won't let each other fail, right? Absolutely not. For and sure, that's, and we've that's got your, room that's your to achievement. Grow. But everybody do, is. do me a favor, talk about the hub and spoke thing. You speak so eloquently about that. And I think right now that, like if I were going to say that's where we could get amazing, that's where we've got a real opportunity. Well, look, that's, that's your freedom as a leader. Your freedom as a leader is to no longer be the individual running around trying to assure accountability. Imagine if you were freed to be your best self doing what you strategically should be doing and your strength and service of this company. And it may or may not be finding everybody at the nuance and coaching everybody at the nuance and holding everybody at the nuance accountable because they've got each other's backs. It's like when, you know, Michael Jordan learned to pass the ball, right? You got to be a member of a team that is interdependent. And there are very few teams that are truly interdependent. You got to pass the ball. You got to, you got to care about each other's success. Mm -hmm. The coach isn't the only coach. Most companies have not unleashed peer to peer coaching as the core strength. So like what we do in Guatemala, when these kids commit to not let each other fail, we took for very, one very large organization that is now growing at 30% higher growth rate than its competition, having come out of bankruptcy. Um, that company, we organized the entire field sales organization into peer-to-peer -peer support groups that committed not to let each other fail. I'll give you something interesting just to think about. You probably be already doing this, I would imagine, but I think staff meetings are the worst uh, use of corporate real estate in most companies today because you use your staff meetings for report outs. Right. That's useless. You should be using your staff meetings to rough each other up, to have collaborative problem solving, to solve things together, to break through ideas, to innovate. That's what the valuable use of combined real estate should be, right? And you should have your employees fighting to come to the table with ideas and problems that they have that they want the team to solve with them. So you talked earlier about your birthday request to get people feedback. And originally, I know you were doing it anonymously, and then people started signing it over time. Um, talk a little bit about the importance of that shift to no longer being anonymous and what yeah. that means. Well, we do it in, in the second meeting. We, our, our standardized product is that over a six-month period, we go into an executive team, and we commit that this team will begin to practice new rituals, new practices of high-performing teams that won't let each other fail. Right. In meeting two, we do what's called an open 360, where we start with the leader and people would say, Tom, because I admire you, um, here's what as a leader I most admire. And we do this once a quarter. So in the last quarter, here's what I've most admired about you. And then, and then everybody goes around and says what they admire about Tom. And then the next point is, Tom, because you're a leader and your success is so important to our success, um, what I've noticed in the last quarter and what I might suggest is, and they offer caring criticism. Mm. And everybody goes around and gives that to you. I've seen executives in tears, not because of the criticism, 
but because of the generosity of spirit. Most of us take the things that we know we're doing badly and we're ashamed of them. We hide them. Right. You know, we meet with them in our manager and whisper about them. And we think about them as something that's debilitative and it might ding us on a performance review. That's bullshit. I mean, at the end of the day, you need to lean in and celebrate that. You need to carry it in your back pocket with a little list. You need to tell your peeps around you, hey, this is the shit that I'm doing that's stopping me from getting to the next level. If you see it, call me on it. I love that. Right? Hell yeah. That's an open, that's, and one small practice, that's a philosophy, but b- philosophies are bullshit, right? <laughs> right? Philosophies yeah. are bullshit. What matters is not philosophy, what matters is practice. Right. An open 360 once a quarter, that's a practice. Shifting your, shifting your dialogue from report outs to collaborative problem solving, that's a practice, right? You know, so we have curated hundreds of high return practices that are in service of accelerated business outcomes. Right. And I mean, our mission of our company is to grow companies and grow people because this is the stuff that you bring to the workplace every day is the same stuff that you have at home and the same tools and the same human nature and the same anthropological tribal underpinnings. It's the same shit. And if you can see growing up here in the workplace, as the same path that grows you up in life. I mean, that's a synergy that's joyful. And then, you know, you guys have been very successful. Imagine the supercharge power you could have in that regard. Business is human. Everything is, Business is human. Keith, I, I, man, I cannot thank you enough for coming on the show. This has been incredible. I hope you guys have questions for this man. We're gonna be doing a Q and A with Keith Ferrazzi, guys, stick around. I normally, right now, I'm like crazy high energy, but you're melting my brain. I love it in the best possible way. Guys, if you haven't already, this is a weekly podcast. Be sure to subscribe. Keith, where can they find you online? Because there's a lot of cool stuff that yeah, you're putting my out. Name, KeithFerrazzi.com. Boom, check it out. He's on Twitter, he's on Facebook. He's got his own blog. His blog is amazing. You're gonna wanna start reading that stuff. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Never before do I think you have ever uh, witnessed me impacted in real time as much as this episode. This was insane, man. I'm super grateful for you coming on the show and for all the research that you've put into behavioral science and understanding what people actually have to do to put it into action, which is absolutely incredible. And you're right, the only thing that matters. And oh my God, by accident, I'm actually wearing the shirt do, which to me is to remind me to always take action because as you so eloquently put, that's the only thing that makes a difference. Guys, thank you for being a part of it. Until next week, be legendary, my friends. Take care. Thank you so much. Coming up next, Inside Questions. All right, so a lot of what you guys were speaking of was inner city kids and they're not having like the mentor to tell them to give them the self-confidence. My question is kind of the reverse of that. How do you take it to where you figure out what you want for yourself and not really what your parents want for you? You can't divorce yourself from um, other people's voices in your head until you can be quiet enough in your own head to hear your own.